welcome to the Board of Education Town Hall on April 13th. We're glad that you could be here to join us tonight. We are streaming this live and uh, we are grateful that you made it out to Mitchell High School tonight so that you could join us for the Board of Education Town Hall. My name is Deborah Ashby. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the district and I see some folks over here. We've got a, a, a good intimate group tonight to ask some questions. I uh, just, uh, before we get into everything, uh, I would actually like for the board to introduce themselves and please tell us your role. I think you have uh, microphones right here and down at the end there, so please use the microphone so that we can have our folks who are joining us on the live stream hear everything that we're saying tonight. Director Jorgensen, Vice President. Director Jason Jorgensen, Vice President of the School Board, and been in my fourth year, I guess, of my first term. We'll see. Hi, I'm Julie Ott. I'm a director on the board, and I was elected originally in 2017, re-elected 2021. Good evening. Uh, proud to be here, uh, home of the Mitchell Marauder, Marauders, uh, and thanks for all of you for being here too, and thanks for the district uh, for setting this up and all the district administration who's here too. I'm Parth Milpakam, fourth year serving on the school board. The first couple of years I served as the treasurer on the school board. I currently serve as the president of the board. Uh, I'm a parent with a child in the district, with a child in the district. So that gives me added skin in the game, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, I serve both as a board director and as a parent and look at uh, all agenda items that come in front of the board uh, with both those perspectives. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name's uh, Al Loma, D11 board. Um, I was first elected in 2009, uh, went to 13, and I thought it was free. And then I lost my mind. And, and, and ran again, Norm. And so this is this will be my uh, sixth year of serving on D11 board. Um, and I'm glad everybody came out. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come on out and ask us whatever uh, you'd like to ask. Uh, let me just also mention this. Uh, Director Nelson is out of town and she can't join us. Director Bankers, unfortunately, is still recovering from her traffic accident and so she won't be joining us. And apparently, Director Daniels is running late. So okay. we'll start with our group out here. Uh, before we can go on to the questions, I do want to mention to you that we have a handout right up there in the front. And this handout, which is a two-page document, it essentially captures, summarizes the work of the board the, the, that the board has been involved in over this past year. Sometimes with the, all the noise that happens around board meetings, the actual work, work of the board, uh, and the work that the board gets uh, involved in uh, does not get the necessary recognition. And this document captures it. And this is the document that actually impacts our schools, our staff, and our students. Some of it makes a difference in the pocketbook of our staff, the health and vibrancy of our schools, so ultimately paying dividends in the classrooms. So I, I do want to mention that to you. And uh, another thing that I want to point out is that we are in the southeast corridor of the district. Uh, and uh, I got some talking points from um, um, some of the good things that are happening in this area of the district from uh, the area superintendent, Ms. Callback. Um, so first thing I want to, pro uh, want to point out is there are 37 seniors that are qualified for the Mitchell Promise Scholarship. Okay, that's a 100% tuition match that the board and the district uh, uh, worked on as a collaboration with uh, Pikes Peak State College uh, for qualifying graduates enrolled in a two-year postgraduate college program. And this is the first year of the program, 37 students qualified for that. Um, and we are also working on a key partnership with United Way, and they are providing food and other resources to families in Mitchell and in the Southeast area. Recently, United Way also provided support for families and staff out here in tax preparation. And Peak Vista, where it's right on that, uh, uh, on the other side where we walked in, um, they are also, um, they have a community clinic right here uh, at Mitchell. They are also working with the South, Southeast schools to expand their reach, providing their service out there, including at Wilson with a second cup of coffee with the principal. Peak Education is providing college and career readiness mentors to support Mitchell students. And there are currently 184 Mitchell students enrolled in Gear Up, 
which is a nationally which is a national federally funded pre-collegiate grant program that is designed to increase the number of low income students who are prepared to enter and succeed in post secondary education all of our college seniors here at Mitchell except for two have completed their FAFSA application students who complete this program are eligible for a $4,000 scholarship upon graduation and uh, we also uh, recently at the Swigert uh, Middle School opened uh, uh, one section of that school a building was set aside for children uh, for friends of children program which is a non-profit program that takes on children that require uh, some of these children come from really difficult, challenging backgrounds, and these children are uh, provided the help and the support right from when they are four to six years old all the way till the end of their uh, high school graduation journey. They partner these students with a mentor, and these students, sta statistics have shown that these students uh, end up graduating high school, go on to post-secondary education, and also um, uh, accomplish some great things. So, so there are some great things happening in the southeast corner of, um, uh, uh, of our district. Uh, often, uh, the, uh, Superintendent Gall talks about uh, District 11 as the heart of the city, and um, uh, as goes uh, District 11, so goes Colorado Springs, and as goes Mitchell, so goes District 11. So we are looking for some wonderful opportunities out here uh, for the Mitchell students and students in the southeast corner. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, President Malpakum. I'd like to, uh, before we get started with the norms, just introduce some of our executive leadership staff who are here tonight, starting with Superintendent Michael Gall. Hi, everybody. <laughs> in the back, we have the area superintendent for southeast schools, Ms. Sherry Callback. The chief of personnel support services, Ms. Phoebe Bailey. Chief of operations, Ms. Chris Odom, Interim Chief. Hello. Chief of Technology Services, Mr. John McCarran. And did I miss anybody? Speak now or forever hold your peace, all right. We also have a lot of staff here from um, our school, so thank you for being here. Um, some familiar faces tonight. Before we get started, uh, we do have a hard stop at seven o'clock to respect the time uh, of our Mitchell staff and team here so they can clean up. Um, as you saw coming in, there's a lot going on today in Mitchell High School. It's really good to see uh, so many people coming into the school and having a great time. Uh, we expect that only one person will speak at a time tonight. Everyone is deserving of respect and kindness, so we all need to avoid distractions or interruptions so that we can get to as many questions as possible answered in the allotted time. And to allow for a smooth, effective meeting, public contact that disrupts the flow of the meeting and prevents others from hearing the speaker won't be tolerated. Uh, we also allow for questions that were submitted online to be addressed first, and as time permits, we'll take live questions during the forum. To respect the Mitchell team, again, we will conclude the town hall meeting promptly at 7 p.m. and we will be addressing questions about D11 as a system, not questions asked about particular individuals. If you have a question about a particular individual, please take it offline for us. I have some comment cards back here and I'm happy to accept those. So uh, with that, I will start in with some of our questions that were submitted online tonight. We have 12 questions. The first one comes from Leslie Eimer. Is Leslie here? If you're here and you prefer to ask your question, please, by all means, feel free to do so. If you would like for me to ask him, I'm happy to do so too. I don't see Leslie here tonight. Okay, Leslie asks, will the change to school hours, this is a dual parter, okay? Will the change to school hours continue in the 23-24 school year? My concern is families with kids in different schools. If an elementary school offers after-school activities, they get out at the same time as middle schoolers. Okay. Anybody wants to take that? Or? Okay. So I'll start with that. Um, so uh, what uh, Leslie is referring to is uh, last year when we went through uh, negotiations, one of the main priorities for the board was to increase the instructional time in our elementary schools. So that was uh, done because coming out of the pandemic, there were several learning challenges for our students. Uh, even before the pandemic, about only 35% of our students were grade level proficient in reading, and maybe a little over 25% of our students were grade level proficient in math. 
after the pandemic, those learning gaps just got wider and the focus was that we need to catch our students up as quickly as possible knowing that if they fall behind further it's going to affect their progression in their k-12 education um, and the, the other thing that we considered was when we looked at the data from any surrounding school district um, uh, every surrounding school district had a uh, uh, greater amount of instructional time than District 11. District 11 was one of the lower, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, instructional time goes. Um, and uh, yesterday, even at the board meeting, uh, we shared uh, the uh, there was a uh, we were talking about the summer enrichment program. By the way, summer enrichment is coming up, uh, and uh, I encourage each and every one of you, uh, if your child wants that extra boost, uh, uh, consider uh, enrolling your child in summer education. Um, and what was shared out there is the need for increased instructional time for our students and how it benefits us. Um, so uh, 15 of our schools are priority improvement or turnaround schools. That's uh, low performing schools that are currently under the uh, state watch. We want to make sure that th the students in those schools are provided the adequate supports and resources. So to answer that question, we anticipate that 30 minutes to continue for this year. We will certainly look at the data. This is the first year that the 30 minutes has been in place, and we will consider what the benefits of that extra 30 minutes is as it achieved the desired goal while we consider future uh, decisions revolving around that. You want to add some? Yeah, I'll briefly add. Uh, before even the pandemic, we, you know, in visiting with school principals and and other you know, ad executive admin, they had just mentioned that we don't have enough time with our elementary school students. And when we, you know, add that to what Director Melpakum uh, mentioned of, you know, the shorter w contact days for elementary compared to other districts, it, it made sense that we would try to address that um, even before the pandemic. Trying to address that would have been great, um, but it's even more important now. Uh, after the pandemic so um, and I think at, 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 uh, to me an even more vital um, need is uh, many many states currently uh, use third grade reading levels uh, to determine prison beds and so b b and one of the key factors to academic health is time in a seat and I, I was really pushing to have more time for our elementary, especially the elementary kids, because if we can lower uh, or improve the reading uh, of, our, of our K through three age group kids, then and in fact, we will affect prison beds. And 70% um, of all prisoners come from a single mom household. And 70% of those are black. And so we, um, this is very important that and so that was the impetus for me to increase that the time now uh, we do know there were unintended consequences for the bus routes but we have a great transportation department and, and um we made a lot of strides getting new buses uh getting a new schedule and so i i think um as we move along and adjust um everybody's needs should be taken care of I failed to mention before we started that uh, if there's a redundant question asked and you don't hear your question read, it's because we're combining some of these questions for the sake of time tonight. Uh, again, uh, Leslie asks also, uh, with the most recent shooting in Nashville, what is the district doing to keep students safe and have we considered asking staff to be part of the security? Uh, I can start. Uh, I know we, we did a... Um, um, we had a company come in and do a, a security and safety audit of every school, every building, every door. Um, and it's very comprehensive. And a lot of the, uh, the um, issues that they brought up that were addressed now, um, building, uh, adding security without making it look like a prison. You know, you don't want to turn it to that. But um, the, these buildings will be secure and our children uh, will be safe based on the recommendation that we follow from the audit that was given to us. Uh, I'll just add that uh, nothing is more important than student and staff safety. That is the number one critical issue. Even before learning happens in the classroom, we got to make sure that our students are and our staff are secure. Right at the beginning of the year, we set aside $11 million yeah. to, uh, to 
improve the entryways into our school. So that $11 million is going to, the work hasn't started, but it's going to start, I think, uh, right at the summer break uh, when uh, schools are uh, in recess. Uh, so we are going to make sure that people that enter our school buildings are properly recognized, identified before they enter our school buildings. Make sure that there are cameras in there, make sure that they walk right up to the office, identify themselves so you don't have unauthorized personnel entering our uh, uh, school buildings. And then uh, based on that audit findings, we set aside some money to, to address some of the issues that came up in that finding. Um, uh, uh, Bullying, discrimination of any kind is not tolerated in our schools. Uh, we don't stand for that. Um, uh, there is an increased emphasis this year on student discipline too. Coming out of the pandemic, there has uh, been a noticeable increase in student behavior. Uh, if a student is disruptive in the classroom, then learning doesn't happen for the rest of the students in the classroom. So that's um, also being addressed. And we have SROs, uh, safety resource officers, in all our middle schools and high schools. Uh, uh, so we are doing everything we can to make sure our students are safe and secure, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. The next question comes from Samantha Payne. Is Samantha here tonight? Samantha Payne? Nope. Okay. Samantha asks, computer learning does not work for every child. How are you going to provide for the children who do not do well with computer learning? There needs to be another option for children who struggle with this type of learning. I think that, you know, we see that today, uh, even with our youth in how the average age that, that youth get their first you know, electronic devices now. And, and we, you know, in education, we're so quick to get the most cutting edge tool to put in front of our, our teachers to facilitate learning that uh, at some point it's gonna be over redundant and, and too much on the digital uh, interface set. Uh, one of my concerns is that we, we're gonna lack having face-to-face uh, -face interactions in a, in a normal and comfortable manner. Uh, you know, most of the times I was at, I was at Kiva Juice the other day after Easter, just getting a smoothie with my sister, and all the, uh, you know, the the workers there had Air AirPods in in their headphones, and and that would have never happened when I was, you know, a younger college kid, uh, you know, working at Taco Bell, which was my first job. They would have, you know, you're, you're done. So, you know, we're we're getting to this tolerance level of digitization and, and digital curriculum, and and letting our 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 tablets and our laptops be the focus uh, for smoothness or enhanced learning. And, and I do think that there is gonna be the pendulum that swings back the other day to go, okay, we've done too much of that. And, and yes, not everybody learns that way or not everybody can stare at a screen that long. Um, and we're losing that interaction of, you know, look at look at our social media these days, you know, the the things that people say on a, on a device versus what they would say in, in face to face. And so there has to be that balance. And, and yes, I, I would agree that we need to look at balancing our, our digital piece with our our face to face and our traditional instruction of that relationship that the teacher does have with our students and honoring and valuing and encouraging that as well as the tools that we get through technology. So uh, it's an excellent concern, one that I think we should look into. Well, and I have found that, that our chiefs and our, um, our principals are pretty responsive to those needs if, if you make them known. Um, and, and you just need, need to make it known that, and, uh, and speak to the need of your child. And, and I, I am confident that we have um, professional staff that, that will take care of that. Uh, it's a matter of communication because I've seen them respond rapidly to situations like that where uh, the child needed um, some special care, so uh, um, that's what, that's what you'd have to do. Just make uh, your principal known, and if the principal doesn't do a good enough job, the the chiefs will step in and they'll they'll start cracking the whip. <laughs> By the way, I I do want to say that Mr. George Smith is here tonight. He is the principal of Mitchell High School, so thank you for hosting us tonight. Um, I'll get to uh, audience questions as soon as we wrap up with the online submitted questions. Uh, the next question uh, came from Rebecca Godinez. However, it touches on a topic that we've already covered, um, the extended school days. Is Rebecca here tonight? No? Okay. We're going to move on to Tracy Montez, who I do know is here tonight. She let me know that she was here, and, and you're probably tired of me talking, so I'm going to let you ask your question. <laughs> Hi, 
my name is Tracy Montez, and I'm with the SPED department here at Mitchell High School. Um, okay. The administration here puts forth applications for hire over to the Human Resources Department after doing the interview and reference checks. Why does it take so long to get our recommendations onboarded to come to work? That's part one. Part two is what is the HR process after they've been notified of the recommendation for hire? And the third part of this is, how can we speed up this process? Because we lose candidates partially because it takes too long to get them on board. They receive other opportunities in the meantime um, while we get nowhere <laughs> with these applicants. So how can we speed up this process? Who wants to take that? You want me to start? Okay, uh, this is um, a, a challenge that this is not the first time we are hearing this. It's been recurring issue that has happened, and I can go back a year and a half. And some of this is pandemic uh, related too, not that I am trying to give any excuses on it. When the pandemic happened, a lot of our staff started working remotely, and uh, there were some uh, uh, staff in human resources department itself had some staffing challenges. So a year and a half back, a survey was conducted by the principals. And one of the top things that stood out from that survey was the support that they were not receiving from human resources. And that survey, we did not get to look at that uh, data from that survey until we had that in interim superintendent, Dr. Gladich, in place about a year or so around this time. And one of the first things that Dr. Gladich did was have a audit conducted about con conducted of human resources. So they came in and looked thoroughly about the working and where are the areas that we can improve efficiencies. And that audit was shared with the human resources department. And I think we have come a long way since a year back. And one of the things that attracted this board in the hiring of Superintendent Gall also was that he came in and he said that the central administration is going to lean in and support our district schools. We are not going to be here, us versus them kind of thing. And over and over again, you would see our area superintendents far more visible in our schools. And that area superintendent structure also provided a clean pathway between the principal and the uh, district departments, whether it is facilities or human resources. So it is still a work in progress. Thank you for that feedback. We want to make the process as simple, as efficient as possible, right from the application process till the point of hire. One more thing I want to mention to you, this is a simple thing. We moved the hiring date this year. When I say we, it's more Superintendent Gall and his administration. Moved the hiring date for hiring new employees by a couple of months this year. Okay, this is, uh, has been uh, advocated by, uh, when I talked to uh, our uh, CSEA Teachers Union, they mentioned that they've advocated it in the past, but for some reason, it was never put into place. So now, instead of being the last school district, hiring after April, for whether it's principals or teachers, we are right at the very top, hiring the cream of the crop candidates that are there. And we see that in the type of candidates that have applied for our principal positions and teacher positions and all those things. So uh, thank you for that feedback. We want to make that process more efficient. And I know that Chief Bailey is there. As far as the hiring process itself, what takes place, I am not proficient to answer uh, what that process is, uh, you would have to talk to Chief Bailey and uh, um, HR department about it. But we hear you, and this is a recurring challenge, and we are addressing it, and we are going to make sure that the process, the turnaround time is much quicker. Well, to echo that, um, when we first got on, we had a meeting with all the um, um, employee groups, and that was one of their main concerns, was the hiring process, so delayed. And by the time they, they onboarded somebody, they had took a, taken a job at another district or another profession. Um, but I do know that uh, under um, Mr. Gall's leadership, 
that has all that hiring has jumped forward, and and um, I, I think you're going to see um, this year, you'll you'll see better results, especially for Sped. Sped is so tough to fill the positions. I mean, you're, they're, we're fighting for. Uh, we should arm wrestle other districts for the teachers because it is a it's, that's a tough uh, a heavy lift. So, but we are addressing it. We're aware, and we're gonna, we're going to keep keep that on our front burner. And, and thank you for your service too. You said you work in the SPED department. So appreciate it's hard work out there. Yeah. Uh, challenging, challenging environment, uh, and uh, what you bring in day in and day out uh, makes a difference in our students' lives. Okay, the next question comes from Stacy Adair. I didn't see Stacy. She's not here. Okay. Uh, Stacy asks Our ESP are very underpaid and underappreciated, and many times kindergarten ESP are expected to teach uh, SPED EAs work sometimes as if they were nurses or psychiatric assistants, and building managers teach behavior and character lessons off the cuff during lunch. Can the board address this issue of pay? And can the board also do more about highlighting and showing true appreciation to these selfless, hardworking members of the D11 team? While we are in meet and confer and interspace bargaining, I would love to be able to tell you the things we're working on in the background, uh, but we can't officially. It is something that we are considering and something that we will be delivering on uh, in a in, a, I think, a big way, uh, and I'll have to leave the mystery at, at, the, at that level. Um, but, you know, a, a kindergartner doesn't know the difference between a teacher's aide and a teacher, and that's no offense to a staff member. It's, it's that the, they're trusted adults in their building, and they, they go to them, whether the, they're the teacher or the aide, they're looking for that trusted adult to, to impart wisdom and, and, and knowledge and character development, as Ms. Adair mentioned. Uh, and, and so, yes, they, they are equally uh, an a important piece in the classroom, uh, as well as other paraprofessionals. And so they do deserve to be compensated. And, and all I can say is, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but we are, are very excited to finalize, meet, and confer at the end of this year and, uh, and put forth what we've been working on in the background. So stay tuned. <laughs> I will add a little bit more. It's a high priority item. That much I can say. Each one of us that are sitting up here have advocated increased pay for our ESP staff. We understand that this is a problem. I've visited schools. I've talked to some of these staff. And in this time of inflation where um, groceries, where you see the pinch when you go to the grocery store, uh, gas, housing costs, all are skyrocketing, these ESP staff work at $15, $16, $14 dollars some time. And they do that because they have a passion to serve our students. And they can easily go to the grocery store across the street or McDonald's and end up making more money. But they want to serve in our schools because they have a passion. And it's only right and appropriate that we as a school board and a district address this. What is available in public that's posted that I can share, I appreciate what uh, Director Jurgensen talked about. We set aside, it's available in the public document, set aside $2.8 million right now in our preliminary budget development assumptions for targeted market adjustments for our ESP group. Okay, so we are going to address this. Last year, we gave uh, historic pay raises. When you go and look at uh, the, uh, I shared a document at a board meeting just a couple of weeks back, and I will provide that information to you in future board communications that come out. Uh, we provided historic pay raises for all our staff, and I don't see that uh, diminishing any way in the upcoming elections, uh, upcoming negotiation cycle, even though we have some challenges right now that we are facing from the state level as far as what the state is going to finance us. We just found out yesterday that we could potentially lose $6 million that we had projected as a revenue the state is going to cut back. So we are aggressively pushing back on our legislators. I encourage each one of you that are out here, contact your legislators. Okay, this is going to impact our staff pay. And they are taking pay money away from District 11 at this point in time, as much as $6 million, to redistribute it to the rural school districts. I have nothing against rural school districts, but they cannot be taking money away from 
our employees and our staff members so they can uh, distribute it. Uh, that to me is not equity. Our staff are going to feel the pinch in their pocket because of this. And we thoughtfully um, put that preliminary budget development assumptions together to provide our staff an aggressive compensation. And this is in the last minute, if this turns around because somebody at uh, state does not feel the ne necessity to compensate urban school districts, that is a challenge. OK. The next question comes from Susan Staver. I hope I pronounced your name right. Susan, are you here tonight? Susan doesn't appear to be with us. So uh, Susan asks, how will you ensure parent voices are honored and remain a priority in D11? Well, I mean, I've gone, and all, all of them have gone. You haven't answered any questions, so that's why I asked you if you want to. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Director Loma, this is near and dear to your heart. Do you want to start that? Okay, I'll start it. Uh, where I come from, parents are first and lifelong educators of our students. There is uh, no questions about the fact that more parental engagement in our schools translate into better student academic achievement and student academic outcomes. So we want our parents engaged in our schools and we welcome our parents to be involved in every capacity. You are, we recognize fully, you are the first and lifelong educator of our kids. Um, uh, and I can go back and look at some of our schools that are performing well, the Steele, the Chipitas, the Scott, the Jenkins, Holmes, all these schools, when you go and look at what's the common thread at all these schools, it's high parent engagement. So we want to honor parent voice in, um, we want to enter into a partnership with our parents and it works both ways. We have a commitment that we are going to serve our parents and with that comes the responsibility of the parents too to ensure that the kids are adequately prepared to come into our school environment. So learning can happen from the very first time they enter into our classroom. Sam, uh, do you want to add anything more? On okay. They've been covering the questions. Is this on? Yeah, okay. They've been covering the questions just fine, so I haven't felt the need to speak up, but um, thanks. The you know, parent engagement um, is an incredible um, value add for schools. Whether you're a room parent, uh, just getting your student to school on time, those are huge and significant, um, impactful things for our students. I want to add that, as, as Dr. Malpaca mentioned, you know, it makes a difference with grades and things like that, but also, um, well, yesterday we heard from one of the charter schools that's been applying to be engaged, and they're bringing their cultures, their family cultures, into the classroom as well. And that is, again, a value add. PTA, school, account school accountability committees, these are opportunities maybe outside the classroom, but that significantly impact the schools. So folks who want to have a voice in the school, you always do. Please come read to the kids, volunteer, be engaged in the school committees or the district committees, because they also exist and the volunteer opportunities are out there. I like that. Um, no, it's, it's good when, when you can volunteer and, and do that, but, but it's often not practical. Um, if it were practical, you'd, you'd have a, a school full of parents. Um, so set that aside, um, I believe we need, we're trying to establish a culture where uh, D11 is, is positioned to serve the parent. And, and I think if we, we come with that servant attitude for the parent, um, because not all parents can be involved, and so that doesn't excuse us from giving that child the best education possible. And so if we, we have a posture that we're here to help the parent educate their child, and we count that not only we're or at that posture, but we count it a privilege that you would trust us to educate your children. I believe if we take that type of posture, it'll create a, 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 a positive learning environment, and that has been my focus since I first elected in 2009. Well, um, I knew we needed to get parent involvement, uh, 
And I even threw out an idea, and people looked at me like I was crazy, so I'll throw it out again, is, you know, we spend um, millions of dollars on tutoring, and, and, and the reason why parents can't get involved is they've got to go to work. And I said, well, why don't we um, pay the parent to tutor and, and, and get them involved in their children's education? We're going to pay somebody. And, and no one can argue that parent involvement increases academics. So um, I think we should be creative. There's some parents that would like to get involved, but they got to go to work because they got to pay for the price of eggs, take a loan, right? And so that's something that I, I had thought about years ago, and, and maybe it's uh, something we can talk about uh, to incentivize those uh, at-risk, lower-income families to get more involved. And I'll be very brief to add to that. When we look at you know, Colorado as a school choice state, and and as a business owner, I think about where I you know I'm I go out to lunch today. And I go, where do I want to go to eat? And I have a choice, and our parents have a choice. And so while we are in the business of public education, without parents entrusting their students to our district, we don't have a public education organization. And so we you know we do need to honor parents and where they're at. Uh, and, and what they do to entrust us with their kids and their, and their pre-K through 12 education and on to adult education and concurrent enrollment and, and all, all those things. Uh, because with, without their children in our seats, we don't have the revenue to make our business exist and sustain. So we are here to work for the parents and, and to, um, because the parents are what give us the ability to have a public education system. So your voices will be honored and, and we will take care of your, your input and, and your feedback. I just wanted to say to the community that Director Daniels is joining us. So, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I apologize for being late. Just got off work and wanted to uh, just say thank you for being here. It's always good to see you. And uh, yeah. Back to you. Okay. Uh, we are moving on with the next question. Uh, and this question comes from Cheryl Saylor. Is Cheryl here this evening? No, okay. Uh, Cheryl says, where does the board stand on the issue of inappropriate books in school libraries? Uh, a, br a brief short answer would be, what is the, the value of that book to the educational program of our district? If it's not age appropriate, if it uh, has a controversial or, or inappropriate images, language, stories that, that can have a negative impact on, on students, uh, then that's something that we would want parents to, to bring to the attention of that building administration through what policy lays out and then for us to evaluate whether it has educational merit for it to be in our, in our school libraries. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a, an open door to, to any kind of book banning or, or any kind of new news article that's, that could be put out there as a result of the comment, but it is to say we want to make sure that the books that we have are age appropriate for our children, that yes, they may be challenging concepts that uh, you, you might not have learned much about so far, but that it will be age appropriate and, and not detrimental to a student uh, in, in challenging some of their core uh, beliefs or, or, or you know, innate nature. So that'd be my, my feedback. I'll add that the board does have a long-standing policy and process to address b books that people might feel are inappropriate. So if there is a concern, um, go check out our policies. Agreed. The policies are in place, and we have librarians who pretty much have been with us for years that see the books feel the same way you do. They're not there hiding anything. Well, you know, in the climate we're in now, there are several states have already um, enacted laws in, in their, their capitals where um, they are outlawing any type of pornogra pornographic um, material in their libraries, with the exceptions of, of, that, of art, um, biology, or anatomy that are needed for the sciences. So uh, and I agree with, wholeheartedly with those type of restrictions. Um, um, so that, that's what we, we look for. If, if you have concerns, uh, let us know. And if, and if it bears no a, uh, academic uh, rel relevance to biology, anatomy, or, or art, uh, then we should address it. Okay, the next question was submitted by Pamela Berg, but it touches on the ESP pay, so we already covered that topic. Um, we're gonna move on to Matthew Moeller. 
I apologize if I didn't get your name right. Matthew, are you here? Oh, not yet, Madison. I will call on you soon, though. Madison has a question, and I want to make sure we get to it. Um, we are on question number 10, and we have like three more to go here on the online submitted ones. Why did the board approve a new health care provider, and how will this affect staff? Well, when we first came in, um, one of the things that I, I, I was aware of our health care, we were self-insured. And, and what that means is we, we covered everything, and that's good and bad. On my previous stint, uh, we had um, uh, 23 students that were, our families were suing the district for uh, the acts of a, one of our SROs that were on, that was working with us. He was a wrestling coach. And that almost, if we hadn't have settled that behind closed doors, it would have shut down D11. It was that um, traumatic. And that, that was because we were self-insured. Uh, self we did have some um, c c catastrophic uh, insurance, but it, it would have been way beyond our capacity to handle. That's aside. The medical, uh, uh, we found just by outsourcing and, and in looking, we just wanted to look, find out, can we get better? Because we wanted to get better. And we also noticed that the ESP, the lower paying uh, employees couldn't afford it. And there was nothing we could do with, with the current insurance that we had. So by outsourcing it, we brought it down to, for a new employee, young employee that doesn't make a lot of money, they can actually afford this, this um, health care, and it's equivalent to what we have and better. It has, uh, um, it even gives you massages and chiropractic, um, 20 massages and 20 chiropractic visits a year at $20 a shot. I wanted to just come work at D11 for that, and, and so... Um, there's a lot of reason why, but if you look at the uh, the current um, insurance that, that our employees are get are getting, it, there it, there is probably not one as good uh, than the one uh, our employees will re are receiving now. Uh, I'll add on to this. Um, so this is uh, something the board just approved. So the new healthcare care, healthcare uh, plan is going to be with Kaiser Permanente. So. In the time that I've been on the board and also serving on the DAC, as Director Loma talked about, we had insurance with, self-insurance with the trust. And we haven't gone out in the competitive market to actively pursue other opportunities. So in October, at the board meeting, the board requested, let's just go out and actively bid and compete out there and see if the trust is the best one that is out there, then great. Then we will go with the trust. And the RFP process went through our benefits insurance committee, which are made up of employees from all three employee groups. I was just sitting in some of those uh, uh, benefits insurance committee meeting in the back listening to the conversation. They were by themselves talking, and this was an active committee where everybody participated. And the feedback that I got from that committee listening to the conversation was, how many years of lost opportunity by not actively going and competing this a few years back. So uh, they looked at the plans that came in front of them, the, um, the benefits that they were going to get uh, uh, on it, and I've covered that and some of that in this uh, uh, handout that you guys have. Uh, and they came and said in front of the group, the ESP president-elect Kevin Cook came and said, this is a win-win-win situation for our employees. So I am thrilled that we are able to offer both a buy-up plan and a low-cost base plan. And this low-cost base plan goes over and beyond what is even required of the master agreement. We are providing a base employee-only plan offer where the district is going to cover 85% of the cost. And already our health insurance plan was one of the best in the uh, El Paso County in the Front Range area. I am really thrilled that we are able to offer this plan, and this is not only going to benefit our existing employees, it's going to help us attract new employees too. Okay, oh, go I'm, just, I'm just gonna add that um, this is an improved plan, so the employees do have um, many benefits coming to them. 
for employees who are listening now, if you do take advantage of this, please pay attention to which plan you're signing up for if you want those massages and things, because there are differences, of course, between the two plans. Um, and just about the trust also, the trust for many years did um, protect employees uh, when we, in terms of rising health care costs. So there were certainly some advantages to the trust, but yes, the board made the right decision uh, to go ahead and change plans. Okay. Two more questions that were submitted online, and the next one comes from Joseph Boyle, and I know he's here tonight. Joseph, would you like to ask your question live, or would you like me to read it? Okay. Uh, he's here tonight with us, though. Um, there are reports from around the country that students are being pressured, bullied, or otherwise compelled to participate in demonstrations, activities, or other actions of ideological nature with which they may not, be, they may, may not personally agree. What's the board's position on this? Thank you. As far as I know, we don't have anyone in our district pressuring kids to do anything outside their will. Uh, I think the only thing we're pressuring them on is to get to class. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of our employees who are in the hall saying, get to class, make sure you're in there. But as far as protesting outside of their will and outside of their desires or whatever, that is not what our staff does. And they've never really done that. This, this district pretty much represents the community. I don't really, I have never experienced anyone going outside of their way to literally say, you better whatever that's not but there i tell them get to class i see it all the time even the elementary students <laughs> every grade level every school that i've been in has encouraged our students to do the right thing do what is best focus and we're in testing right now so they're tired but they're doing everything they can to show up on time and do the testing and do what their teachers have asked them to do I'm going to note that, uh, to Director Daniel's point, another thing that people are always trying to get students to do is their homework. And if people had true power over kids, you know, to get them to do their homework, I'm not aware of any such um, any reality to this comment. So um, perhaps you can enlighten me later if this is if you have some facts on it. Uh, certainly, in again to echo her comments. The focus here is on education and um, letting our kids know what what they need to know for for education, and some of that will be probably real world. Um, and parents, again, being engaged, um, they should be talking to their kids about concerns they have, issues in the world, and addressing those things as a family. I think maybe a different perspective to take on on this question is is not so much as worrying or concerning of what our staff might be, uh, you know, doing with our, our students in the classrooms, but I think more about uh, you know those peer to peer interactions, of you know, hey Julia, uh, I'm taking a stand for this and and I want you there with me and you're going to be there, right? And she might go, oh, well, I feel pressured or I feel compelled to be there with you, even though I don't necessarily agree with it. And what we might want to consider is that perspective of, uh, as, as staff and as a district saying, you, you are allowed to be your individual person and, and who you're raised with uh, by and, and what's forming your principles and your uh, ideological nature. And to the point where we can encourage people that when I go, hey, Julie, come with me to this thing, Julie goes, I appreciate that you're taking a stand for that. I don't agree with it. And, and you do you, basically. And, and I don't know if that could be happening, and that might be the, the point of your question, uh, Mr. Boyle, but I think that would be a perspective that we would want to consider of you know, a, a peer pressure type thing, where we've, we've had peer pressure for, for decades. I mean, we, all of us can, can stand here and share you a story from, from one of our K-12 educations on where we were peer pressured or bullied. It, it's just a piece. It doesn't make it okay. But if we can have teachers that are saying, hey, Julie doesn't agree with Jason, and that's okay. And Julie's voice is honored, and Jason's voice is honored. And if we're, we're infusing that into our, our education and allowing people to, to develop into their uh, nature and into their own principles is what they're getting in their environment, and that's honored and respected, 
then I think that is something that we would want to focus on and making sure that we're taking care of all of our kids in that way. One last question that was submitted online, uh, and that comes from Chris Ann Young. Chris Ann, are you here today? I don't see Chris Ann here today. Um, what do you specifically see as the biggest challenge for District 11, and what are your ideas for overcoming that challenge? Well, I'll start with that, um, and then other board members can chime in too. We have several challenges, staff vacancies being one of them. But if you ask me what the biggest challenge is, it's declining student enrollment. That uh, we've lost, and this is not anything that we are running away from, we've lost over 4,200 kids over the last four years. This year, we flattened that slope of the curve a little bit, but we still ended up losing about 450 students. We ended up getting more than what we were projected for, but declining student enrollment and the resulting loss in financing, that is the biggest challenge that the district faces. So what are we doing to address it? We are making sure that we are making strategic investments at this point in time to turn around declining enrollment. This is something that's been going on for 20, 25 years in the district, and we are saying enough of that right now. We got to creatively think outside that box to go and communicate to our parents and our uh, uh, community that District 11 provides, it is the premier district of choice in Colorado Springs for our schools. We have 10,000 students right now in District 11 that choose to walk away from our schools. They live five minutes away from our neighborhood schools. Instead, parents walk, uh, drive them five miles to another school or another school district or a charter school. We got to provide attractive program opportunities for these students. We got to look at CTE opportunities. We got to make sure that these students receive a rigorous um, academic education, uh, extracurricular programs that are there. And we are doing everything in that regard. Th this board introduced um, uh, free after school uh, uh, enrichment program in 10 of our schools. And that program has been well received in elementary schools. And we hope to capitalize on that. It's not only going to be after school enrichment, it's going to be tutoring programs. So parents have the capacity to put the kids in that uh, uh, after school enrichment if they are uh, working parents. Um, uh, Mitchell Promise, that's uh, a program right here at Mitchell to attract students into the school. Um, uh, the, uh, I can think of uh, several more uh, things, but I will pass on to if anybody else wants to make a comment on this. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge that this trend has been happening for over 20 years. And the pandemic did not help the situation. I think it just opened more people's understanding that this is a real situation we're in now. And the biggest, the biggest area that needs to happen we all have to come together. There, this is not a one man show. All of the layers that took us to be here are going to take us to be out of it. Legislation is one of them. We may all have to get up to the Capitol and say, our kids matter to us. We need you to send money to education because that has been dwindling for decades. I'm a public school graduate. I remember when it started. I was in middle school. By the time I got to high school, everything was cut. And the mantra was, we don't have the money. And over the years, it has been progressing. And here we are. And at the same token, everyone knows our educators are not paid well. I know educators who come out of state and are shocked that Colorado does not pay. They were paid well in other regions, but that is not here. We also have students who are, well, they live with their parents, right? So if they're TDYing out, if their parents are moving to international countries, which a lot of people are doing, they, their kids go with them. We have a lot of different layers happening and we all have to see where do we fit so that we can come together and make this work. Now, obviously, the conversation of charter is there. 
And at the same token, public is there, private is there, homeschooling is there, they're all there. But how do we work together for our districts, surrounding districts, everybody has to come hand in hand. It's all hands on deck at this season. And I'm encouraging all of us, most importantly, not just the teachers going to the Capitol, but we have to get there too and tell them, stop doing this to us. Parents are working hard, yes, because economically, things outside of our control are also happening. And I know parents love their students. I see it every day. I see it more times than not. No one wants their child to be hurting and no one wants them without. We all work hard for them to have it. But it's gonna take all of us to get up there and say to them, release the funds, stop. We can't keep doing this if we're planning to survive. Now, um, to that end, um, they all, they've addressed declining enrollment very well. Um, we, we might have to have an, a conversation, and this is hard, um, to, and realize that maybe D11 is overextended um, because of the climate, because of the different opportunities of schooling. We may never get those, those kids back. And, and if we, the sooner, if, it, if it's a reality, the sooner we, uh, we recognize it, then, then we're gonna have to make some hard, hard decisions in that, that regard. But, um, but I, I do think um, something uh, to me more uh, pressing is the academic achievement that we have, pre-pandemic and post, when it's in the teens and 20s and math and English, um, you know, then um, if we were any, in any other industry, everybody would have been fired if we start all over again. Um, that's how bad it, it is. Now, oftentimes when the parents that come to a meeting like this, your children are exempt because you are the involved ones. But the ones that, that are working and, and, and barely making ends meet, um, they're the ones that struggle. And it tends to be uh, not just black and Hispanic, but poor. Uh, when you look at the demographic, it's the poor that suffer the most. And so um, I believe our academic achievement is the greatest threat to our to our district because if we don't do something about that, um, other schools will snatch them up because uh, parents will go to where the academic achievement is, is, is happening. That I, I see is probably chief. The second, which is part of this, I think they, they might have some overlap, is, is D11 has an aging teaching, an aging teacher um, employee group. Um, a lot of our teachers are on the 15 plus side of the scale and we can't attract young teachers. And the reason we can't attract young teachers is because our pay scale favors older teachers. So the, the younger teachers go somewhere else to get paid more, and, that, and then when they get 10 years plus, they say, so now I wanna go to D11 because now I'll get paid more over here. So it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out, go somewhere else, get your 10 years there where you get more money, get your 10 years over there, then come back to D11 when you can get paid, but you have to be here so long. And, and the system right now is set up for that. It, you just, that's the way those who negotiated the pay structure negotiated it. So until we can start getting younger teachers and paying them, because we are the bottom uh, in pay scale for younger teachers coming in. And if I'm a young teacher, I'm not gonna come work at D11. I'm gonna go to D20 somewhere else where I can get more money. And then later on, in 10 years, I'll come over here because then it pays to be over here. So we have to, we have to balance that, not flip it because we need older teachers, but we need to attract younger ones because if we don't, eventually we're gonna run out of teachers and we're gonna have to shrink our, because we're not gonna be able to uh, man our, our, our employee group. And that to me, is the most important thing uh, that we need to address. Okay, real quick, we got one minute, and I also want to make sure that we get to Madison's question. That was what we were going to say: was we're deferring to be able to get some live questions here. <laughs> Fantastic! I'm going to come to you, Madison. I know Madison is a second grader at Wilson Elementary School. We talked earlier, and she had a question for the board tonight. Um, I have a question: Will schools put more reading classes in schools? First of all, I, want, I don't want to answer, I just want to go hug her. <laughs> go ahead. Well, yes. Yeah, do you that's like reading? Do you love reading? Yeah, that's wonderful. 
and madison I, when i walked into the room she recognized me and she came over and said that i was at her in her class reading when for dr soon's week wasn't it yeah so uh, yes simple answer yes we want to make uh, reading as much fun as possible for students and uh, the one thing that i always share with students not only read at uh, in the school but before you go to bed take 10 or 15 minutes read with your siblings read with your mom or dad uh, read with your grandma uh, reading is the one that is going to get you in the right pathway even uh, math science social studies all of it is the fundamentals is reading we have come to the top of the hour. I do apologize. Um, we didn't get to live questions tonight, but I do want to let you know there are several ways that you can get in touch with your Board of Education members to communicate with them. Uh, the number one way that we have now is a new tool online. It's called Let's Talk. If you go to d11.org, and on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a tab that says Let's Talk. There's a Board of Education category on Let's Talk, and you can submit a comment, a question, feedback, uh, what have you, and it will get delivered to the Board of Education. They are very responsive um, and have collective input. All of their contact information is also listed online d11.org and then you click on the school board tab at the very top of the page and you will find their contact information again they're very responsive and welcome your feedback anything else i can no thank you thank you for all of you for joining us this evening we appreciate your questions we are always available reach out to us I know that most board members will respond back to emails too and would be happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one too if necessary. I'm always available. Dr. Loma says the same thing. I, I'm sure all the other board members are happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and have those discussions and conversations too. So thank you for being here and please stay engaged. Uh, what Director Daniels talked about, go in, uh, to the Capitol and uh, advocate for more money. They are taking away $6 million right now. I shared that right at the very beginning. It behooves each and every one of you to go and advocate against it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.